This is a reminder that when you're watching uh, the videos at home, you need to take notes. Just sitting back and saying, oh yeah, Ms. Burquist, I hear ya, I hear ya, isn't going to do it. You need to take notes. I will be checking your notes uh, when, do, when you come to class on Tuesday uh, to see how you're taking notes. But this is an example of some note taking that I know you've done um, in some English classes. Giving you um, an area in your notes to put your notes um, we're using a recorded lecture. You can summarize things, abbreviations, make sure you skip between some points so it's easier to um, figure out different ideas and main ideas. On the side, here's your cues, um, giving you like maybe if you're defining a word, put the word on the side. You can ask yourself questions on the side. What's a great thing about taking notes at home is that you can go back and forth um, and uh, listen to the lecture and not miss any points. And if you don't understand something, why don't you put it down maybe even in the summary area or even in the queue area, and it will give you a question to ask when you uh, come into class. An example, let's see if I can get an example for you of um, like a science note taking. Let's see. Okay, so here's an example of maybe a Cornell type of two column note taking. Um, and you can see they put the keyword solid and a liquid and a gas and maybe gave some definitions. We're not covering solid li liquid gas in this lecture, but it's just a good way of um, organization for you. So let's get started with learning the families on the periodic table. Here's your lesson on periodic table of elements. Periodic table, the modern periodic table, is divided into horizontal rows and vertical columns. The vertical columns are called groups or and or families. We're going to discuss all the different families on our periodic table. Going across our horizontal rows are called periods. We have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven periods. They are called periods because patterns repeat over periodically over and over again in each row. Going up and down we have our vertical columns and again we call those groups or families. We will number our families 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. Some periodic tables will number it all the way across including our middle elements. This is usually the way that I will represent our elements. Most of the periodic table consists of metals. We have a stair step and let me draw that on here for you so you can see. This stair step indicates anything to the left of the stair step are metals you can see that the periodic table is mostly made up of metals. Anything to the right of the staircase are nonmetals. Ran out of room. Most elements are also solids at room temperature. There are very few liquids at room temperature. Mercury and gallium and bromine are some of are the only liquids known at room temperature. Several of them are gases. And I'll show you the gases once we get uh, to those families on the periodic table. The ones that border the stair step, and I'll represent those in green, and I'll kind of color them in here, are called metalloids. Got bromine, SI, silicon, Uranium, AS, SBTE, PO. Those are called metalloids. You can see that they're right in between a metal and a nonmetal, so they have properties both of metal and nonmetal. They're kind of the in between elements. We will talk more about the classifications of metals and nonmetals in another slide. 
The first group or family on the periodic table is the alkali metals. The alkali metals are highlighted in green. This is vertical column number one or the group or family number one. Some properties of the alkali metals is they are very reactive. If we look on the very bottom, our very last one, element FR, is the most reactive element on the periodic table. If you add these um, elements to water, they can have um, an explosion. They have one electron The second family of the periodic table is called the alkaline earth metals. Alkaline earth metals, as you maybe can guess, have two electrons in their outer shell. So they have two valence electrons. Alkaline earth metals are reactive, but not as reactive as group one. They are also metals. They uh, contain all of the properties of metals that we will discuss um, in an towards the end of this video. Transition metals. Those are the big bulk of metals. You can see how they're highlighted in orange. The bottom row here um, and here are called the inner transition metals. If we actually take the periodic table and slice it right here, kind of cut it, these guys would be inserted in there and I'll show you in a minute what that would look like. It really just moves the periodic table along into a bigger arrangement. Transition metals have a variety of valence electrons. We, I am not going to put a number on the top to tell you how many valence electrons they have because they have something called subshells. Let's think of them as little pockets. Sometimes they could have one valence electron but if another element comes along and says hey I want to bond with you, but I need two. They'll reach into that inner pocket, into their subshell, pull out an extra valence electron in order to bond with that element. These are where some of your most common elements are found. If we look at this one here, this is element Fe. That's maybe a familiar one of iron. And we just move along a couple spots and we'll have nickel. And I know we're used to copper since we just did a lab with copper and zinc. These are some of our more common. Underneath we can have our silver and our gold. These are some of the more common elements of our periodic table. They contain properties of metals. We will talk about all of the general properties of metals in a second. The halogen family is in group seven. They are located the second to last row on the periodic table. The halogen family, we call these the salt formers. A lot of times the group seven and group one will come together. Maybe you are familiar with this common salt where we have chlorine and chlorine hooks up and reacts with sodium and we get Na. Cl, and that is our sodium chloride. That's the everyday table salt that we put on all of our food. These guys have, maybe as you can guess by looking at its group number, seven valence electrons. I represent an electron instead of writing out the whole word in E in a little superscript of a dash. That's just the short chemistry cool way of writing electrons. These guys um, have seven electrons. They only need one more electron in order to be stable. And then we're going to talk about our last stable row in just a second. But they have seven electrons so close to getting eight. Eight electrons is a full octet. You can hear the word oct. Oct means eight. One of the last groups we're going to discuss on the periodic tables are noble gases. Noble gases are all gases, hence the name. We have some of our most common that we've heard of. I know helium because we get, them, get that in helium balloons. Neon we see in lighted signs. Argon can be another very popular one. Krypton. Now krypton that they showed in uh, Superman was a green rock. 
Obviously, that has to be wrong, because krypton is a gas. What is Hollywood thinking? We can also have a radioactive one that we're going to talk about later called radon. Noble gases is in group 8. Can you guess how many electrons they have in their outside shell? You're right. Eight valence electrons. We call this group a stable. They have a stable octet. They are the ones that everybody wants to be. They are noble, the noble gases. Here are two different, our two different groups, our main groups of the periodic table. On the left, we have metals with lithium, calcium, and sodium. I've illustrated here for you. I bet you can try to come up with some properties of the metals just by looking at what they what they look like in those pictures. And to the right side, I have two other um, elements, helium and chlorine, and those are examples of nonmetals. I bet you can come up with properties of nonmetals also just by looking at those pictures. Let me help you come up with some properties of metals. Metals are great conductors. Oops, sorry. Of electricity. They are shiny. Um, they are also something called malleable. And malleable means something that you can bend. We also call them ductile. Duc ductile means it's something that you can pull into a wire. And sometimes rolled into sheets. Think of aluminum, aluminum foil, right? We can roll and push that into, sh into sheets. They also... Conduct heat. Oops. Got to work on my typing. The next one we have is, whoop, we can't see that, can we? Let me see if I can fix that for us. Okay, now that I have that all fixed up here, we're going to look at nonmetals. Nonmetals are usually gases. Some of our most common are the chlorine and the hydrogen and the helium. They are basically the opposite of a metal. So they are poor conductors. Of heat and electricity. And because they're gas, we can't bend them, we can't stretch them. In other words, we call them brittle. If they're a solid. Now I know the other word that we talked about was metalloids. Metalloids basically have properties of both. They're right in the middle. Okay, so metalloids are somewhat shiny, somewhat malleable. I wrote duckless. I don't want duckless. Duckdull. Sorry, I don't know how to change that right now. Um, let me see if I can. There we go. Okay, and um, so metalloids are kind of right in between. They're not brittle, but they're not malleable, so they're kind of right in between.